That's right, Kitty. Today is the start of a brand new series on my channel. It's called Who Did It Better? Where I'm going over adaptations and original source material of various properties. And first up on my list is Alita Battle Angel. Now, I didn't even know this was a manga until I saw it. It's like, oh look, it's a manga adaptation. And I'm like, huh, okay. And then one day, as I was browsing Barnes & Noble, I saw this deluxe hardcover edition that contained the first six volumes of the original Alita Battle Angel manga. Well, since the manga covers pretty much everything in the live action movie directed by James Cameron, I thought, huh, you know what? It would be quite an interesting video to compare both. And that's what this series entails. Oh yeah, and if you have any recommendations for what I could cover next, please leave them down in the comment section below. And like and sub if you fancy. And another thing, I'm going to be as objective as humanly possible in this series while taking a look at adaptations of various source materials. So, let's get started. So, one thing James Cameron really excels at is world building. Even if the movies he's worked on don't always have the best story, at the very least, the worlds he creates are primming with life. And Alita Battle Angel is no different. James Cameron is definitely one of the premier experts on world building. And he takes the world of Alita Battle Angel and improves upon it. See, the thing is, a lot of the larger elements of Alita's world aren't really introduced until they're physically in the manga. Probably the worst case of this was Motorball, the sport Alita plays over the course of the live-action movie. She starts out by playing it with Hugo and his friends, but in the manga, Motorball never comes up until Alita is physically a part of the sport, which doesn't make a lot of sense as why would she join Motorball if she's never heard of it before or the readers have never been made aware of her knowledge of this sport. There's other things too, like even characters. Hugo, even though he's described in the manga as being a fixer-up type of guy going around from house to house, He's never actually physically in the manga until Alita interacts with him, which is very odd to me. At the very least, James Cameron weaves together these elements and has set up for a lot of the larger elements of Alita's world. Even, even Destiny Nova, who really in the two deluxe editions I have has only appeared on a single panel and is mentioned once, which is better than a lot of the earlier elements that were introduced, but still, Destiny Nova in the movie interacts with a lot of characters and has a bigger role to play other than simply being a flashback. So definitely, James Cameron wins with world building in Alita Battle Angel. There's quite a few characters in Alita Battle Angel, so in order for this video to not be super long, I'm just going to go over the main ones. Alita herself, Dr. Ito, Hugo, Vector, and Destiny Nova. First up is the title character herself, Alita. I'm just going to put this out there. Not even James Cameron can replicate her adorableness in the manga, but he certainly tried, coming very close to a real, lifelike Alita. Now, as for comparing the live-action Alita and the manga version of the Alita, James Cameron honestly did it perfectly. Her arc from going from a naive cyborg girl to a badass cyborg girl is done pretty well. I know that there's definitely a bunch of story content that was cut out, but it was done very expertly. She still has her naivete, she still has her love for Hugo. Everything that makes Alita Alita is brought over very well into the live action version. Now on to Dr. Ito. Dr. Ito is the man who found Alita, gave her a name, a home, a body, and is essentially her father figure. Now, Dr. Ito in the live action movie and Dr. Ito in the manga are very different in how they are portrayed. 
And the manga, it's almost like breaking down Dr. Ito's walls little by little as you learn more about him. However, in the live action movie, it's basically like, yeah, I wanted Alita to be my replacement daughter without no contest. But in the manga, Dr. Ito is more of a mad scientist. He is intrigued by Alita and wants to see what makes her tick. And that's pretty much his whole motivation for getting her out of the scrapyard. While in the movie, uh, Dr. Ito and Alita's relationship never go past the point of, yes, I wanted you as my replacement daughter, and now I actually think of you as my daughter, and I care for you. In the manga, Dr. Ito and Alita's relationship changes constantly. Ito in the manga, basically at the beginning, regards Alita as sort of an experiment, hence why I refer to him as a sort of mad scientist. He's intrigued by Alita, as she is a lovely piece of ancient Mars technology, and that's his whole reasoning for fishing her out of the scrapyard to begin with. So, of course, like in the movie, Ito begins to care for Alita as a person. However, the question was, how much? What did he perceive their relationship to be? And thankfully, in the second deluxe edition, I got my answer. See, after Hugo's death, Alita runs away. She abandons Ito, and as he'd later find out, she's joined the sport of motorball and has become kind of a jerk, brushing off Ito as if he wasn't even there. And after getting tossed out by the motorball staff, Ito drops the picture he has of Alita. It's kind of like this transparent holographic picture that he's been using to tell people what Alita looks like. And that's another indication of he really is becoming a fatherly figure, despite not ever admitting it, even in his own headspace. Now, what Ito decides to do next is very amusing. He, through a series of coincidence, is, comes into contact with the motorball champion Chisugan and ends up saving his life. So, Ito then is like, okay, I'm going to join this guy's team so that he can kick Alita's butt and she can come crawling back to me. So that's another example of his sarcasm deflection. And later on, while Jisugin is watching Alita's game, he is now the first person to get into Ito's headspace and discern what he's thinking. He's like, okay, I know you two are close, or used to be close, what's your game here, Ida? And after being pressed on by Jisugin for a bit, Ido finally, sincerely, admits how he feels about Alita. He loves her as a father, would. he even calls her his runaway girl, and he's worried about her. This is a payoff for his character as Ido has now become the person that Alita had always thought of him as since the beginning of the manga. Her loving father and a good person. Which is just honestly a way better payoff than it was in the movie as it's way more complicated than simply just telling Alita how he feels, but what he needed to do in the manga was tell someone how he felt about Alita without Alita in the room. Honestly though, I do think both versions are acceptable. It's just that the manga version has a not so typical relationship combined with a man who never admits how he feels to others and who does not actually want to care about anyone as much as he does Alita in the second deluxe edition. Now, on to Hugo. If there's any big, big mistake I could say James Cameron made, it was with the entire character of Hugo, who is Alita's love interest in the movie, as well as the manga. Now, on the surface, all 
of the things that make Hugo Hugo are still there. He's still Alita's love interest. He's a fixer-upper type of a guy. He does whatever he can to make it to a million pieces so that he can go up to Zalem, which is the floating city in the sky. Um, but it, his character just simply doesn't work in the live-action movie, as Hugo is a character who believes in a lie. And two of the most fundamental aspects of a character who believes in a lie are not present within the character of Hugo. See, a character who believes in a lie is someone who's come to believe something false about the world they live in. In Hugo's case, it's that if he gets a million pieces, he can go up to Zalem and live the good life, or at the very least be present in this glorious utopia in the sky. Of course, that's a lie, but the thing is, there's two other aspects. See, one, why do they believe in the lie? Two, have them live in the lie to the point where it affects them. Okay, that's present in the movie. Three, have him confront the lie. The why he believes in the lie, which is essentially an origin story of sorts, and the confrontation are not present in the lead of Battle Angel. But in the manga, they actually go in depth of why Hugo believes in the lie that he does. His brother wanted to build an air balloon to look up at Zalem from a distance, and he thought they were going to succeed, but his wife decided to sell them out to a hunter warrior so that Hugo and herself wouldn't get killed. And Hugo runs away believing that they could have succeeded if she just hadn't sold them out. And then confrontation, you know, in the movie, Alita confronts Vector about his lie to Hugo. But in the manga, Hugo and Alita go together to confront him after Hugo's put in the robot body. And you just get these unsettling couple of pages where Hugo completely loses his sanity. And in a bout of temporary insanity, he bust open the window and then he climbs up to Zalem because in his mind, Zalem is the only thing that matters in this world and he refuses to accept that he had been believing in a lie this whole time. Of course, Alita goes up to him like in the movie and unfortunately, he meets his end, much in the same vein as the movie. The difference here is, is that Hugo's life in the manga, for what he's been working for all of his life, it came crashing down around him. But in the live action movie, since the why and the confrontation aren't present, when Hugo dies, I feel bad for Lita, as she's a much more developed character, and she has the why she believes in the lie that she does. But Hugo doesn't. It's just, oof. Yeah, James Cameron really screwed the pooch on this one. And it's not just his character either. What could have really mitigated this, perhaps, is take the last 20 minutes of Alita Battle Angel and have it be spent developing Hugo's character more. And as well, it just makes more sense as to him throwing his life into this lie in the manga as after, you know, he runs away, he starts donning a bandana, he starts fixing up everything, and he's had these overalls. He lives in this abandoned, burnt-down house, and he doesn't even appear to have any friends, per se, unlike in the movie. So, the lie that he believes is more ingrained in his mind in the manga than it is in the movie. In the manga, when Hugo dies, I feel bad for Hugo, and not really that much for Alita. You know, I think that James Cameron and his team definitely did have a good foundation. However, they forgot the most essential parts of what Hugo's character is. He is not a Disney Channel prince with a motorcycle, um, perfect hair, and a leather jacket. He's 
just a simple boy looking to make his way up to a big utopia in the sky. As for Vector and Destiny Nova, who are pretty much the main antagonists in the live action version, um, James Cameron definitely did a really good job with them. See, they have a bigger role to play. These two men have all of the power over the scrapyard, just like Zalem had power over Dr. Ito's wife and Hugo in the movie. So they each play a bigger role. You get a better idea of what they're all about, even though Destiny Nova mind probes, I'm not sure how that works, um, into Vector's head and talks through him. You still get a better idea of his personality, even though he's not physically in the room. So when Destiny Nova is revealed at the end of the movie, it's almost like, oh yeah, you go get him, girl, right? Type of a deal. So I do believe Vector and Destiny Nova were handled very well in the James Cameron live action movie. They have a bigger role to play. They have all the power, so they dominate each scene that they're in. Very much so. Even the camera angles always pan over to them and people start acting differently around them just to maybe grab power from them. Or rather because they're afraid of Destiny Nova. Now, as for the stories of both the two deluxe editions I have, as well as the story of the live action adaptation, both are perfectly acceptable. While the manga is more oriented towards adults with its story, um, the live action adaptation is more of for, you know, teenagers, whatnot. So that's why it has PG 13. I mean, honestly, I don't believe a PG 13 would have sufficed if some of the fights in the manga had happened, like Alita fights this one guy who eats brains and wanted to eat a baby. That, that's fun. Um, however, I do believe that the live action flows better, but it's almost at a much faster pace. You know, more downtime could have been used in the movie, like as I've said before with that last 20 minutes where the movie kind of lost me as it was pretty much just CGI noise so more of that 20 minutes could have been used even to have some downtime moments some character moments etc however both stories suffice you know if you like more violent and brutal action then yeah then the manga is for you with a much darker tone and but if you just like all these epic scale fights and what have you with people ripping each other apart, then the live action adaptation is for you. Two adaptations, however, have in common is that they were made with a lot of love. I can tell that, you know, both of these were made with the prestige and care, you know. James Cameron and his team, they definitely took a lot of time to you know, bring Alita Battle Angel to life. And that's why I can ask, even if it's not the greatest story, even if the characters come off wrong, it still did what it needed to do, and that was adapt the material. So, that... <laughs> I know that some people keep calling it, you know, the best live-action manga adaptation, and you know what? They're probably right. James Cameron did a pretty good job, and while I would have liked to see some stories, it does suffice as a, another version of Alita.